I'm only the co-author of the Dark Victory book, and my co-author, Marion Wilkinson, joins me in greeting you tonight, and also, once again, congratulating the legal teams who tried and failed to get the people off the tamper. To Eric Pedalis, who I have to say no longer looks like his photograph, but then none of us do. To the team from Pilch, who were also, and all of them, who were so wonderfully helpful to Marion and me when we were putting that book together. I think we owe ourselves a duty not to get wrong what Australia thinks about boat people. And I wish I could share Julian's optimism about a change of heart in this country, but it is not there. In the last few months, a series of polls have been taken to see what Australia's fundamental attitudes are to asylum seekers who come to this country by boat. Let me give you just a selection of a few of the findings of those polls. This is the Lowy poll from earlier this year. Despite everything people like you and me have been arguing for 10 years or more, 63% of Australians believe that boat people are queue jumpers. 62% of them, this is of the whole of Australia, these are very good polls, 62% of them believe that boat people are potential security risks. 60% of Australians, and now I move to an Ipsos poll of a few months ago, 60% of Australians worry that the boat people will bring with them terrorism. Only 40% of Australians, and now I go to an amnesty poll, believe that people coming to this country by boat are genuine refugees. And only 47% and only of Australians believe that we have any treaty obligation, whatever, to house refugees in this country if they arrive here by boat. And yet, last week in the age, you will have seen a wonderful figure from a Nielsen poll, a Nielsen poll that I helped design, which shows that 53% of Australians believe that once boat people have got here, we should deal with them decently. It's a very reassuring figure. We don't like these people. We don't want them to come. We think they bring with them the possibilities of violence and terrorism. There are even some very uncomfortable figures about them bringing disease. But nevertheless, there is a principled belief in at least 53% of us that once they have got here, we deal with them decently. We assess their claims for refugee protection. And that is about the only reassurance I can draw from polling figures at the moment about the attitudes to boat people. There has always been, of course, a constituency for doing the right thing to boat people. It's there from the very, very beginning. What might be a robust constituency if politicians cared to turn to it and to develop it and to lead it. The first boat, as you probably know, arrived in Darwin Harbour in April 1976. It had sailed with the, help of a, with the help of a little compass and a page ripped from a school atlas from Saigon to Malaysia, from Malaysia to Darwin. There were five men on board. They had a great deal of difficulty finding anybody to turn themselves into. They eventually did the following morning and they were the first boat and it caused an earth. It caused in this country a psychic shock. The moat no longer protected us from yellow people in the north. There were very few boats in that first boat wave and very, very few people. There were about 2,000 people arrived by boat. And although Malcolm Fraser can rightly be praised for settling in this country nearly 100,000 Vietnamese refugees, he and his government did everything, and that everything included sending parties of people to sabotage and knock out the hulls of boats. They did everything to make sure boats did not reach Australia. 
It's always, always, always the boats. That's the focus of the terror in this country. It's the boats. Um, in 1979, the first poll on, on the boats was taken, a Morgan poll, and 32% of those polled, and it was a good poll, said that these boat people should never be allowed into, into Australia and they should all be made to go away. But 60% said at least some of them should be allowed to stay. That's the start of the decent constituency. But of course the politicians decided that is a, as, an, as a strange exercise in bipartisanship that they would play to the fearful constituency and not to the decent constituency in this country. We associate bipartisanship with great reform achievements, with things like opening up the Australian economy to the world or, and crucially, dismantling the white Australia policy, bipartisan arrangements, uh, things that could not happen in this country unless the major parties declared a truce. Well, they did declare a kind of, they did declare a truce on boat people as well, but they decided together to kick the shit out of them. And they have done so from 1976 ever since. Mandatory detention was introduced to this country in 1992 as a bipartisan arrangement after a total of 2,400 boat people had reached Australia between 1976 and 1992. 2,400. By the end of the second wave of, of boat arrivals in 1993, there was another poll, this time a Solwick poll, and that showed that the proportion of Australians who wanted all boat people sent away was 46%. It had risen. It had risen quite dramatically. But still, but still the constituency that wanted boat people allowed into the country and processed here was bigger. It was 48%. There was always the other constituency, the constituency that politicians decided not to play to. Now let's not fool ourselves that this is not about race. I love it. I'm going to collect at some stage in my life all of the statements from people like Ruddock and Howard and Alexander Downer and Janet Albrechtson saying, this is not about race. And indeed, to, and indeed to, to argue that it is about race, and I suppose I'm edging over into the Janet Albrechtson area now, to argue that it is about race is actually a thuggish attempt on behalf of people like me to silence debate itself. It's an act, she says, of censorship to declare that race is at stake here. Just as we should look at the figures, they should too. And there is no doubt from polling over a very long time that the people who are most worried about the boats are those who are also most worried about any immigration to this country from anywhere but Europe. They are also revealed to me by that wonderful statistician and political scientist Murray Goot recently. They are also people who are highly likely to object to what they consider are privileges extended to Aborigines. And they are also highly likely to want capital punishment returned. Now, that's the core of the fearful constituency in this country that John Howard used during the Tampa. The brilliance with which he beat up a panic in that time is, is as a professional exercise, probably unmatchable in the history of this country. What he did, of course, was to ally race fear with patriotism and bring the two together into this explosive combination where suddenly our borders were at risk. And, and he was the one who brought into this area an expression that had hitherto only been used in rather highfalutin arguments about tariff control, and that's border protection. Border protection is John Howard's invention. Border protection, which we still use, brings into this the indescribably pompous notion that these boat people are actually invaders. Just after the Tampa finally sailed, Morgan again did a poll. He did a poll here, New Zealand, 
America and the United Kingdom, and a very, very simple question about both people. Would you let them in and process them, or would you send them back to sea? Back to sea. The toughest way of putting the question, would you send them back to sea? The United States, 25% for sending them away. New Zealand has never had a boat yet, except for some long canoes once. 44% for sending both people away. The United Kingdom, 43%. Australia was 68%. Off the dial. Now, it's reassuring to me that a couple of years later, when much the same question was asked by another pollster, the 68, 70, 74% approval ratings for what Howard did during the Tampa had, a couple of years later, halved. Australia looked at what happened at the Tampa, a bit down the track, and had second thoughts about what happened there. Tony Abbott, no, 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 no. Let's, be, let's give honour where honour is due. The bipartisan arrangement between the parties survived Tampa. It was hugely damaging to Labor, but it survived Tampa. It actually even survived the Kevin Rudd reforms. Um, the coalition ticked off on all of the reforms in 2008. But at the end of 2008, as the boats began to come back, um, uh, Malcolm Turnbull began to take advantage of it. And for the first time in the history of this country, the opposition began a campaign from opposition to damage the government over the failure to be cruel enough to the boats. And that intensified under Tony Abbott, as you know, and that continues now. The statisticians, uh, the, the pollsters over the last few months all agree that the attitude of Australia, I'm afraid to say, Julian, is becoming gloomier about the boats. They're becoming more pessimistic about the possibilities of controlling those boats. Eight polls over the last seven or eight months have asked the question, is Australian policy towards the boats too soft or too harsh? Now, the figures are actually all over the shop, but it's very, very clear where things stand. I've done a mathematically completely unforgivable thing, and I've averaged them. Those who think that the current policies about boat people are, rather, are, are either okay or too soft, 75%. Those who think the current policies of the Australian government towards boat people are too harsh, 10%. I think you're all part of the 10%. We cannot fool ourselves that there is a strong democratic reassessment of what has been done and is being done to the boats. It is not there. Change. There's something up there, oh, it was originally, saying possibilities of change. Both parties in this country are, <laughs> are gutless on race. Thank God. <laughs> Both parties in this country are gutless on race. But since John Howard, during the Tampa and now under Tony Abbott, we have seen a remarkable thing in this country, which is the politics of race, campaigning on race, turning to the, race of, to the racially fearful as a source of political strength, is being carried out as a strategy by a mainstream party. In Europe, this is done by nutter parties. In the United States, it's done by nutter parties. In this country, it is being done by a mainstream party, where in fact, inside of which and whose supporters, where the forces of decency far outweigh the forces of extreme conservatism who like this kind of thing. I've said this before and I say it again. Change, the possibility of real change, the possibility of solving this problem has to start inside the Liberal Party. And it has to start by the overwhelmingly decent people who back that party and who are members of that party standing up for themselves and their values inside that party and compelling change. Unless 
because I have so little faith in the Labour Party being able to get itself together in this field, my confidence is, my belief is, that we are only going to solve this mess, this embarrassing mess, if the Liberal Party cleans up its act. Thanks. Ha! Now I get a chance to ask them some questions. I'm going to start by asking these two a couple of technical questions about the case. We're told to put these virtually in our mouths, but then they start to sort of bite back. Okay, Julian, Debbie, do you now regret not going straight to the High Court instead of going to the Federal Court? No. We got two bites instead of one. You're lost. Debbie, what do you reckon? No, no, it was, it was the right place to go. And at that time, the impediments to going to the federal court weren't there, and um, that was the right place to go. It was a, a trial court, trial judge, right thing to do. And I can tell you from two weeks ago, it's very hard to raise a high court judge on a Sunday. So, <laughs> <laughs> can we know what Hayne was actually doing when you rang? Was it golf? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Second question about the case. Do you regret now allowing the people off the Tampa and into the Manura? Yes, we were misled. The government misled us by um, saying in open court that the Manura was a troop ship well uh, equipped for catering the, to the needs of a large number of people. And then, instead of being put in the residential parts of the Manura, they were put on the tank deck, a, a huge cavernous area where tanks and other armoured vehicles roll on, roll off, adjacent to the engine rooms, furiously hot and incredibly noisy. No air conditioning, no, no, no daylight, mm. yep. no sound insulation mm. from the engines. It continually strikes me as one of the most utterly shitty things that the government did at that time. It, it's, it doesn't beat leaving the Palapa for 24 hours unrescued mm. while they tried to get the Indonesians to do the job. Two planes flew over the Palapa the day before its rescue. Two Coast Watch planes flew over, and they knew it needed to be rescued, but Canberra decided that they'd try for the first time ever to get the Indonesians to do the job. And there was a violent storm that night, and we nearly had another 438 dead. And Canberra didn't give a damn. Anyway. I, I, as a person who used to vote Liberal, up to and including, dare I admit, 1996. Um, I, am, I now view the Liberal Party with contempt as people almost incapable of telling the truth and almost entirely divorced from any sense of decency about anything. Julian, I cannot urge you strongly enough. No, I cannot urge you strongly enough to get back in there. I, no. was, I was never in there. I was never in there. <laughs> Debbie, uh, I put a mark on a piece of paper. Oh. That's what they all say. Now, now, Debbie, I know it was a terrible place to put the people on the manure, um, to put them down there, and I'm very glad to see the manure has been declared a rust bucket and is being waited, waiting to be sold for scrap while the Tampa still sails the world, making millions for the Wilhelmsen line. But, Debbie, just strategically for the litigation, was it a bad idea to actually let them off the Tampa? Strategically? Yeah. It had a huge effect, and you saw that right through to the special leave application. I mean, yeah, but it was on a on a human level, there wasn't really a choice. I mean, you can't. Those people were suffering enormously, and not through um, uh, you know anything but the best efforts of the the crew on the Tampa. But I mean, it was you know it was a huge amount of human suffering. So you can't ask people to sit in those conditions when what we were told was that there was a much better option for them mm. while we litigated. Yeah, so well, you, you, you know, you act in good faith and in that sense it was the right thing to do, but it was, um, uh, it changed the momentum and the um, focus of the case enormously. You talked about an increased sense, an increased um, commitment to the rule of law that you feel coming through these cases. 
But isn't this an area where you have an executive that has shown at times complete indifference to the ordinary principles of the rule of law in carrying out its policies? What can the courts do cleaning up after the executive when the executive does the kinds of things that it has done in the last 10 or 12 years to these people? Well, it can, um, it can bring them in the into line, but as you say, I mean, sometimes it does look like they're cleaning up after the event. But if you look at, for example, the M61 case last year and the, um, uh, the High Court's decision to allow people who are offshore entry people on Christmas Island and then on the mainland access to the courts, I mean, that was, that was a tremendous, um, mm. tremendous decision. But at the end of the day, if the executive then carries the majority in Parliament, they do what they like after that. And then it's not up to the lawyers, you know? I mean, we do our job the best we can, and then, you know, you guys have to take over from there. Somewhere, somewhere along the line, you, you, have to, you have to vote a government in that will um, adhere to what the courts have said. Simple as that. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But I, I just can't help. I, I'm, I'm still processing all your concern about uh, Australian attitude to votes. And I blame it on 1788. I think it's a hangover from then. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. There's no other answer that actually is Oh, no, it makes sense. No, I don't it think makes so. sense. I mean, I'm not no. saying it's... I'm not saying... And it. it's because governments lie to the people. If the people actually knew what was going on, if they knew that two or three times as many people come by plane seeking asylum as come by boat, and the numbers are tiny anyway, would they really be as desperately enthusiastic about what the government is doing? But isn't this one of those, one of those issues which are fascinating because the facts have no traction? We have been saying there is no queue forever. Hmm. And 64% of Australians are absolutely convinced these people are queue jumping. We have been, there has been no lack of publicity for the fact that usually most, most asylum seekers come by air. Usually they are not detained. Usually their claims for asylum turn out to be bodgy. And usually they're sent home again. Mm. None of that is secret. But these facts don't have traction because they don't come out of the mouths of our political leaders. You They're need, just poor old commentators. You need and to lawyers. write for the Murdoch press. <laughs> um, and we'll have a discussion about that sometime. <laughs> um, because because there's an interesting, there are interesting subtleties about the Murdoch press's handling of this. I mean, the Australian, oh, yes. the Australian is the only newspaper that regularly has a reporter and a very good reporter mm. on Christmas Island. Mm. Yep, yep. Anyway, we won't... We, we, Sorry, I, I didn't... You know, I mean... So you I'm, should have just I'm taken not it here a, to be... Into, you you know. should have just taken it as a comment. Ah. <laughs> but, but look, a last thing from me before we open it up. This is me being... This is me being bleak about the last decade. As compared and the lawyers, with... As compared with just before. Yeah. Hmm. About <laughs> lawyers and the courts and the last decade and acknowledging the, the thrilling win in M M61 but we still have mandatory detention. The High Court's ticked off on that. The High Court's ticked off on detention without trial. The High Court has ticked off on detention without trial, perhaps forever. We still have children behind the wire. We once again have very large numbers of children behind the wire. We still have the excision regime and the, and the case that went to the High Court with M61 um, uh, ticked off once again on the notion that, a, that boat people have no right to have their um, asylum claims assessed in this country. And now we are about to export asylum seekers to camps in Papua New Guinea or a scrap heap in Malaysia. I mean, it's not much in a decade, is it? It's pretty grim. Uh, that's not the law's fault. <laughs> that's my point. I mean, my point is that I think the courts are doing and, and judges are doing an increasingly strong and responsible job of insisting on the rule of law, but the law is what it is. And, you know, you have to 
you have to look to your parliamentarians for making that. If you don't like it, they're the ones you're holding responsible for it. And that's where it comes back to what I think what you've both been saying about um, what's, what is the true reflection of attitudes in the Australian community. And maybe what we're seeing and the things that you're um, rightly condemning is a true reflection of attitudes in the Australian community. And that is what you've got to change. Okay, now over to the audience. There is a roving mic, I understand. The roving mic is seated for the moment, but now the roving mic is... Now, who would like to ask my colleagues here? Mineta, just a minute. Down here, no, down no, in front. Mm. I'm running this show. <laughs> um. Could you introduce yourself to the people who can't see you? I think so, yes, certainly. I'm, uh, my name's John Mineta. I had an involvement in the Tampa case with Juliet and Debbie um, and, and Pilch and others. Um, I also had an involvement in a case with Julian in which to add to the list of tick-offs where the High Court ticked off on um, uh, conditions of detention in this respect that they ruled six to one, as I recall, that even if conditions of detention within, for example, a desert detention centre were as harsh as can be imagined, that would not affect the lawfulness of that detention. So, and following up from, on from that and also from the tensions too high a word, but what just passed between you, David and Debbie, on the question of, in effect, is the judiciary doing a good job in this country? I wanted to ask this question, is there a problem with values that affects a significant proportion of our judiciary? And le let me read you something that I brought here for a completely different purpose. Um, it's, it's an extract from a speech that Chief Justice French gave in the United States in January 2010 when he was telling them about the Tampa case. And you'll all recall Chief Justice French was the, um, the intellectual underpinning of the majority that dispatched the Tampa asylum seekers to their various fates. And what he said, crucially, was this. The question, that is the legal question about executive power, etc. The question was raised sharply in 2001 in Australia in a rather heightened political atmosphere. Acting, then he described how the vote came over the horizon and so on. Acting pursuant to section 61 of the Constitution, the Australian government sent troops to secure the vessel, to provide medical and humanitarian assistance to the asylum seekers, and to prevent the vessel from landing on Christmas Island. Subsequently, an arrangement was made by intergovernmental agreement for Nauru and New Zealand to receive the asylum seekers while they were processed to determine whether any of them were entitled to the benefit of the Refugee Convention. Many of the asylum seekers ended up in Australia. Many of the asylum seekers ended up in Australia. And when I heard Fiona open tonight, I think the figure she mentioned was 28 out of over 400, which is roughly the same number who, according to reports in The Age last week, were returned to Afghanistan and fairly promptly killed. I don't mean the number that were returned to Afghanistan full stop, I mean the number that were killed on return. So my question, and I'm not trying to single out the Chief Justice, but in light of what strikes me as quite a poor thing for him to have said extrajudicially, extra is there a problem with the great way our judiciary goes about what it does? I don't think so. Um, I, I think in this area, one of the problems is that because the judges are wedded to the rule of law, they are willing to give effect to laws that should never be on the statute books in the first place. Um, some try harder than others to find a way around those laws. And I think reading the different decisions in the al Khateb case are quite interesting. You can see that at least one member of the majority did not seem to be trying at all to reach a decent solution. 
um, whereas the minority did find their way to stepping around the apparently intractable language of the Act. Um, so I think that's the problem. Um, it may be that at some subliminal level the judges are also influenced by the prevailing community misconceptions about refugees and that might influence how hard they're willing to try to find a solution that we might think more appropriate. But I have no doubt that they all try their hardest to apply the law as they understand it and, and that's why we get bad results because our political leaders have betrayed us all and are trashing our national values by passing and reinforcing laws that should not exist at all. Uh, I'm unsurprisingly not going to say anything about the Chief Justice. Um, but I do want to say this. Uh, it's tempting in politically charged circumstances to uh, speak about the way that judges go about their decision making um, by characterising it as trying to get the right result. Now, of course, what the right result is all depends on what your perspective is. And the minute we start asking judges to get the right result, for example, from the perspective of everybody sitting in this room, we give the freedom to other judges who have the entirely opposite perspective to get the right result from their perspective in their cases. And what you have then is an encouragement for judges to depart entirely from the rule of law and act according to their political and personal consciences. And just because we sometimes might like them to do that in cases that we don't like, we, just, we jolly well don't like, want them to continue to do it as a matter of course. So the best thing that we can encourage our judges to do, in my view, is to adhere to the rule of law as it's made in this country and hold our parliamentarians accountable for that. And could I add just one thing to that? A senior judge a little while ago, when there was a, when, the, when, a, when things had gone in a terrible result, said, look, said to me, and I was moaning about the result, he said, we don't have much to work with. And he was talking about the fact that the High Court is one of the few senior courts left in the English-speaking world that has no charter or bill of rights that they can turn to, that, or, or even a simple, a simple provision in the Constitution guaranteeing equal treatment before the law. It's, we just don't have it. We are peculiarly, we are, we are becoming more and more a museum court in which ancient, judicial techniques are the only way forward. Yeah, David, that's something that probably we should have brought up earlier in this discussion. Mm. I, I, the isolation, the uh, legal isolationism of Australia now in terms of uh, international human rights jurisprudence is pathetic. And until we do give our judges more to work with than that, uh, we can't reasonably expect very much at all. It's interesting, uh, reflection on that, I was in, in London in 2003 and I went to, uh, was introduced to a bunch of European lawyers um, and the only thing that any of them knew about Australian law was the Tampa case. That was the only thing they'd ever heard of about Australia. Are they familiar with Brian Beaumont's decision? <laughs> um, I, I don't know whether they'd read it, but they... I've read it several times and I'm not familiar with it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm over here. Uh, my name is Eric Fadawas, so I was a little bit involved in the Tampa case. Got the naming rights. <laughs> um, as far as uh, going on the manure is concerned, I have to tell you that they promised us these people would be on the deck with uh, uh, lovely uh, sort of accommodation. And uh, I think they made a point of telling us that every room had CNN, so they could actually see what was going on, because they wouldn't actually let us tell them about the fact there was a case on about them. But that's another story. Um, my, my concern really and from the time that I got involved in this, is, is really very simple. Australia signs all these conventions, you know, the Refugee Convention, and the Rights of the Child and so on, but then again they come home and put them in the drawer. You know, not many of us know that we actually have no rights to enforce those conventions in this country because they've never been enacted. So the government says, 
look how fantastic we are. We've signed this convention. We're now part of the bigger picture. And we've got it here, and they throw it in the drawer. So what good is it to have a convention that we can't rely on?